We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Fridays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash yttw and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call tw. Everybody, welcome. We are live. Today is Sunday, September twelfth, two thousand twenty-one. That which means we are twenty years and a day uh, after the attacks uh, of nine eleven. Which means in a year or so, uh, the babies that were born because of people embracing each other after that attack will be able to drink alcohol. So it's amazing how the celebration or the the, the commemoration of that event has changed over the years. Uh, I I ran across a number of people yesterday who didn't even know what what anybody was talking about and i'm uh i i like the fact that uh that we're focused on really important things now i just wish the focus wasn't necessary like why should we be fighting for you know a right to choose and things like that but we are live here on the atheist experience i'm matt Delaney. joining me this week the wonderful arden of eden how are you hey i'm doing great i'm so excited to be here and i i, I hope i don't uh make a fool out of myself for you you know sweet i hope you do but uh in the most fun way because then we get really good clips but you may know arden from the transatlantic call-in show on the line network or right here in the aca on the nonprofits. although yesterday arden mentioned that her favorite aca show is secular sexuality so you get to run the full gamut here look i, I don't know what to tell you i i like sex and i like being secular so it's just that's how it is that's the way it's got to be. We're going to jump right into calls right now with uh, Andrew. And before we actually start, I want to remind everybody that uh, we are constantly working and trying to improve the tech quality of all of our programs, but there will always be some sort of delay on the internet. I'm doing my best to get better at uh, processing extra gaps in to make sure that we're not... Some interruptions are intentional. Some interruptions are not intentional. And so we ask all the callers to please be patient if they're interrupted and to... Uh, Please, you know, try to insert some gaps so that we can do it kindly. But Andrew in Pennsylvania had a question about non-believers and souls. So welcome to the show, Andrew. How can we help? Hi there. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, so, um, well, first of all, I am, I consider myself an atheist. I was raised Christian. Um, and I guess I am questioning, like, my beliefs. Um, and I'm having a very hard time kind of coming to grips with the idea of not believing in hell. Like I, I hear you talk all the time about just kind of throwing away like everything you believed in, in terms of religion. And I don't quite understand that. Like, how can you be so comfortable just not believing in hell. Well, these sorts of things definitely aren't aren't easy, Andrew. I mean, it, it, well, for some people, maybe it's a, a a quick shift. I think there's a lot of people out there and a lot of people in this community who it took them years to get over their fear of hell. A lot of people who probably still struggle with a fear of hell. Um, so you're definitely not alone in in that regard. Um, I don't know, Matt. What were you thinking? Well, it's it's. I wouldn't say it's easy. I, I I would never say, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that it's easy. Once you find your way out of religious belief, particularly after indoctrination, to just say, oh, I just tossed all that stuff aside. That is not really what I'm saying at all. Um, but if you found out, if you'd been told your whole life that you were going to inherit a billion dollars on your thirtieth birthday, and you turned thirty and it didn't happen. How much longer are you going to sit there and, you know, be concerned about that billion dollars? You've got to get on with your life. And at what point, sorry for 
at one point after learning that something you believed in as a child turned out to not be real, how long do you keep hanging on to that stuff? And so for me, it was a practical matter of saying, uh, I don't believe I have a soul. I see no reason to think that I have a soul. I see no good, compelling evidence that anything that makes me me continues to exist after I'm dead. And if it turns out I'm wrong, there's nothing I could do about it. Like, which heaven should I try to get into? Which hell should I try to avoid? Rather, I, I would be, I would rather be just intellectually honest and say, I'm not convinced any of those things are true. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But you, you, the thing that you're concerned about, Andrew, is kind of like, how can you be so comfortable? What if you're wrong? It seems to be the thing that's that's nagging at you. And my question to you would be, okay, what what reason do you or anyone else have to think that I'm wrong? And which religion do you think you should pick in order to avoid the anxiety of potentially being wrong? Yeah. So I, I guess I'm sure you've heard, um, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but I'm sure you've heard um, the saying, like, God finds you where you're at. Um, and, and I've heard you say before, you know, what, well, you know, what says, who's to say that this religion is right, um, which is a very good point. Um, but to make the argument that any religion is essentially the same, it's all religion, is, is a good point. But at the same time, the argument could be made that God finds, if, if, you, if you're in a, in a specific religion, God found you there. So if you, and I'm just arguing devil's advocate here, if you got to heaven and God is like, oh, well, you denied me, and you could be like, well, I didn't know it was real. And God was like, well, you, you know, you were presented with this, with this message, so you couldn't really deny that that was real. So like you're presented with something and you can't really deny that you didn't know. That's kind of okay. where I'm coming from. I'm like, okay, so it's, it's purely like self-preservation. Like if I know something, like you gave the example of a billion dollars. If you told me I was going to get a billion dollars and I, and I get to the point where you thought I was going to get a billion dollars, I would also not change anything. Like if I, if I'm not going to get a billion dollars, it doesn't matter to me. So it doesn't really make any difference. But it does. I don't have to change it, anything. It, no, no, Andrew, it does because it changes how you how you act and how you spend your life. If you think you're going to be a billionaire, if you genuinely believe you're going to be a billionaire, it changes what you do. But first of all, you said something like God finds you where you're at. Well, I have no evidence that there is a God, nor do I have any reason to think that there's a God who's going to find me where I'm at. But if God finds me where I'm at, then maybe there's a God that uh, rewards people who aren't gullible. Maybe there's a God who rewards people who aren't fearful. How do you pick which God you're going to claim to believe in in order to avoid the problem? You, you haven't solved this because if you say, well, at least if I believe like there's some kind of God out there, then whatever the real God will is, he'll reward me for that. Well, that's a load of bull because that's not what any of the major religions teach. If you show up at Yahweh's, you know, throne saying, well, I didn't really believe in you or Jesus, um, but I believed that there was something. How have you solved that? Yeah. Do you think you can trick a God into giving you the better afterlife just because you, you know, you have, why, what is wrong with saying, I have no reason to believe any of these? Because I can tell you this, if I show up in an afterlife and a God does what you said that a God would do, which is say, you were presented with all these, all this evidence, that God's a, a, a lying idiot because the evidence that he points yeah. to, th th there's no evidence that any God could point to that it was sufficient to convince me that a God exists. Yeah, I agree. That's that's kind of where I'm coming from, though. Like everything I know about the Bible is, it either says that there is no God or that the God of the Bible can't. Po it's impossible for the God of the Bible to be real. I mean, logically speaking, it's it's impossible. There's too much against the God of the Bible for him to be real. But at the same time, you can make the argument that if the God presented in the Bible is does exist, just not as presented in the Bible, he m might just be a maniac. He might be a psychopath. And then, and I, I know I'm arguing for something that's just a possibility or maybe not even a possibility, but at the same time, I mean, you're kind of Andrew. in a position where... Andrew. 
Would you spend this much time trying to argue that maybe you should believe there's a monster under your bed? I mean, is the monster under my bed threatening me with something? You don't know that it's not. Yeah, it, yeah, it sounds like this this thought and these feelings are like uh, like almost compulsive in a sense. Andrew, are you finding that they're like like causing issues in your ability to like live your life and like have relationships or anything? Because like it with how distressed you sound right now, and I could be wrong, but like I, I would almost be a little concerned for like uh, your well being in in some sense. Like I would hope you have. Um, a therapist or at least someone close in your life who you can talk to about these kind of feelings. Yeah. Cause the, the question's really no. simple. <laughs> the question's really simple. What do I have reason to believe is true? And if someone's saying that I'll be punished for not believing something that I didn't have enough evidence to believe, then you can do that. You can say, but then I would be more moral and more righteous than the person who's punishing me. It'd be like a parent who says, I gave you enough enough hints that you were supposed to clean the, the garage this week, even though I didn't spell it out. And because you didn't do it, now you're grounded for six months. Well, no, if there wasn't anything, if there's a God that's willing to punish me for not believing, then that God should at least show up and give me a minute of its time. Yeah, I and I understand. I agree with you across the board that any god that did exist would have to be a monster. I'm I, I'm totally with you there. So it's I not mean, my position. We, that is not no, my position. No, that, it's it's strange. No, 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 Andrew. It's strange that I can sit here and repeatedly explain something and then have callers say, "I'm a hundred percent with you. Any god that exists must be a monster." No, that's not what I'm saying. No, and as you as you presented that, if that was the case, that would be a monster. That 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 example would have to be a monster. I agree with you. So maybe sure. I, maybe I phrased that wrong. I agree okay. with you that in that case, that God would have to be a monster. Sorry. So I agree with you there. And so what case do you the have that could the Bible? What gate? You keep going back to the God of the Bible. You do realize that there are plenty of other proposed gods. Which God are you arguing right. for believing in, and why? Well, I'm arguing for the I'm arguing for the God of the Bible. That's the God I I don't believe the God of the Bible. That's what I was raised with. Okay, that, that's so what I was raised on. What are you going to do if you get to an afterlife and one of those other gods is in charge? I would say that I was not raised to believe in them. I never reject. I never wasn't. I didn't reject them. I wasn't well, raised to believe in but, them. So I'm, okay. I but but, but saying, Andrew, saying that you weren't raised to believe in them, if I were God, I would point out, this is a logical fallacy. Why do you think the criteria should be what you were raised to believe in? The truth is the truth, young man, whether you were fucking raised to believe in me or not. Um, yeah, there were plenty of people who weren't raised to believe in me, and yet they found and discovered me. Where did you fail? How do you? What are you going to say to that God? And I guess this goes back to, you know, God, the, the saying, God finds you where you're at. Just like if, if everybody in the whole world was raised on Christianity, that's where children only believe what they're told. If everybody in the whole world is raised with... That's the not Bible, true. Every no, none of that's true, Andrew. None of that is true. When you say children only believe what they're told, that's not true. When you say God meets you where you are, that's not true. None of the things that you're arguing for have been demonstrated to be true. You're either going to come up with a compelling reason to believe in something or you're not, and you're not. How is it not true that a child believes what they're told? A ch you said a child only believes what they're told. That's not true. Plenty of children find their way out of indoctrination, and children don't always just believe what they're told. Some children would surprise you. But in any case, you're not a child, Andrew. No, no, no you're, you're missing my point. I'm saying up that the God of the Bible could be taught to everybody from the very beginning, and up to a certain point, every child would believe in that God. So, no. speaking, that, no? No, they wouldn't. There are people who go into Sunday school and get kicked out for asking questions because they don't believe. And some of those people are children. I don't, I, I'm done, Andrew. There's no point in continuing for you to try to keep justifying the God of the Bible. There is no justification for it, and there is no justification for believing it. That's the point. 
I'm not justifying the God of the Bible. I'm, I'm, I don't support the God of the Bible at all. So I don't understand what the point is this of this call. Can are are we like missing what like the punchline is here? I guess I'm trying to understand how how you. I mean, I heard Matt say that when he left Christianity, he he didn't. Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he didn't like second guess himself, or he didn't like, you know, he didn't have any like, qualms about um leaving he didn't really look back right correct kind of trying because to i reckon for the same reason that i'm not still scared of monsters under my bed and i don't still believe in santa claus and it doesn't bother me so I, right so yeah. matt said those things so so why are you bringing it up then so i'm trying my my initial question was i'm trying to understand how somebody who believed in the god of the bible can walk away from that belief and not and and still say he doesn't know if there's a god but not have the question of there he not and he doesn't even question if there's a hell even though he says he doesn't know if there's a god he's not questioning at all if there's a hell like that's not even in his mind so that's my that's my question how how are you saying I just told you god, yeah i think that's what my just answered. i just told you for the same reason that i'm not still wondering if there's a monster under my bed Okay, but your your initial belief in a god would lead you to some kind of understanding that there might that there is po the possibility. My initial belief in a monster under on my bed might lead me to some kind of understanding that there might be a monster under my bed. There's no argument that you're going to make that's going to counter what I just told you. When you stop believing in something, if you're still afraid of it, you haven't stopped believing in it. Well, I I don't know if that's entirely. True. I feel like you could make an argument for a fear in hell that's more based in like a an obsessive, compulsive, like intrusive thought kind of thing. That, but that'd be more like pathological. I think, generally speaking, sure. Like, I feel like you're accepting that there. You, I mean, you're acknowledging that there is a possibility of a god. No, I'm not. But at the same, I. I mean, how are you not? I. I just. How is it I can say I'm not, and then you say how are you not? At no point has there has it ever been demonstrated that a god is possible. Therefore, I do not accept that it is possible. I just haven't concluded that it's impossible because that hasn't been demonstrated either. Every claim, possible, impossible, hell, no hell, all of those need to be demonstrated. But if I sit here and worry about things that haven't been demonstrated, that that is a life-ruining exercise. It is it is the the source of anxiety and depression and all sorts of things. I'm, I'm in no way saying that God is possible. I have no idea if God is possible or not. If somebody thinks God's possible, they can demonstrate it. How would anybody demonstrate that it's possible there is a God? And I've heard you make a, I've heard you ask that before. And I, I mean, I have in my own mind a way that I believe somebody could demonstrate to me and that I would find um, sufficient well, then why didn't you answer the question? I'm asking, I just asked you, how would someone demonstrate that a God, that a God is possible? And instead of doing so, you tell me that you have an idea. What, how, show me, show me, Andrew, how someone could demonstrate that a God is possible. I mean, if they, if they um, supplied um, a detailed way that prayer had worked, like they're like, okay, I prayed this, this way, and they, had a, they laid out how their prayers were answered specifically, I would, I would consider that to be a, um, evidence. Of well, you'd be wrong, because, because somebody would have to show that a prayer, prayer was made and that it came true. And then you have to draw a connection between the fact that it apparently came true and that and, and the fact that it, something was prayed for. And then you have to draw a connection between the fact that it was prayed for and that an actual God uh, could have answered that. You haven't demonstrated, just because you prayed for something and it happened, doesn't mean that it's possible for a God exist. In order to demonstrate... No, you, you, not, that's not what I was saying. That's not what I was saying. Andrew, Thank Andrew, you. stop and listen. Okay, I'm doing you a favor. I asked you to show us how someone could demonstrate that a God is possible. And you came up with an example that in no way demonstrates the possibility of a God. Do you have an example that demonstrates the possibility of a God? No, I, I, 
I cannot demonstrate the po- I cannot demonstrate the possibility of God at all. Cool. Can you think? Do, do you think anybody has a way that they've demonstrated that a God is possible? If you go back and listen to what you said, what you had asked me initially, I said that I that I have a way that somebody could demonstrate to me that I would find sufficient. Andrew, we're not making any progress because you're not listening. I asked you to demonstrate that, give your example of what would prove to you that God is possible. And the example you provided should not con- con- convince anyone that a God is possible. Oh, okay. And then when I asked you if you could demonstrate that a God was possible, you said no. So where, where do we disagree still? I, I, mean, I don't think it's possible. I can't demonstrate that, as po- that a God is possible. I cannot do that. Okay. I don't think, I don't think, I, mean, I don't think it, yeah, I can't do that. I don't think and, and so if you can't demonstrate that a God's possible, that means you're not going to be able to demonstrate that a God's real. And now we definitely have no reason to be concerned about a hell, right? I'm probably not. I mean, I, correct. I believe that, I believe that's true. Now, if that's the case, why would anyone still be worried about a hell? Um, just because I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. And why? What, what are you scared of? I, I don't even know if you would say you're scared of something. I think you could say that you were conditioned for a long time to be scared of something. And then finding out that thing doesn't exist doesn't necessarily make those neural pathways automatically shut down. The exactly. fear might still be present, but when you learn to, when you stop believing over time, those pathways will stop firing over and over again. And eventually you will have less strong reaction to that thing. It might not ever fully go away, but it will definitely get weaker over time, but it takes time and you shouldn't be hard on yourself. If like the fear of hell didn't magically disappear the second you stop believing. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why we're both on here is because Arden just summed up exactly the point that I was hoping maybe we'd get to, because it's diff- this is why I said, nobody said it's easy. The fact that I don't sit around and still worry about a hell doesn't mean it was necessarily easy for me or for anybody else. Right. What right. happens is people are indoctrinated. And for the same reason that somebody might be irrationally scared of spiders or heights, those things at least have something real to tie to both the fact that spiders and heights exist and spiders and heights are dangerous. So those things tend to get in there, but you can have an irrational fear of both to the point where it it is crippling you from enacting or acting because of those things. Similarly, you can be conditioned to be fearful of something that has no tie to reality at all. And that's what religions do. This is the point that we're trying to get to is that It's fine. You know, I'm not saying this is easy. I, you asked, I, you said you didn't understand how I couldn't be sitting here with a fear of hell when I haven't, you know, when I've acknowledged that I might be wrong. Uh, that's because I don't sit around with a fear of things just because I might be wrong. And I don't sit around with a fear of things just because I was indoctrinated to be fearful of them in order for me to be fearful. It needs to be based on rational evidence. I'm fearful of cancer. I'm fearful of what my blood sugar is going to do in the next, you know, week or whatever. I'm I'm fearful of all kinds of things that are real concerns. I'm fearful of what's going to happen to people's rights. I'm fearful of when the next war is going to happen. I couldn't give two shits or be the slightest bit concerned about which particular religious fairy tale I was indoctrinated into and what terrifying threats they made because their threats have consistently proven to ring hollow. If their God could so much as give me a hangnail, he hasn't demonstrated it. I'm not the slightest bit afraid of any God that's ever been proposed because I've been sitting here for 16 years calling them all immoral monsters and thugs and pointing out how they're stupid and they don't present evidence and how none of us need to believe in all of them. And I'm doing just fine. Did that help? Did it make things worse? No, no, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it helped. Um, it makes sense. Um, yeah, I, you're right. I, I, um, lo- I mean, logically, I, I know 
Um, that. Yeah. It, uh, I hear you, Andrew. This this, like, this is really normal. You're on a good path. And I, yep. I think this conversation seems like it's come to, a, we're not really getting any further, but like uh, you're on the right path. This kind of thing happens. We, we see this all the time on transatlantic too. You know, people will call in saying like, oh, I know logically trans people aren't bad, but I still feel weird when I see them. And like, sure, when you've been conditioned your whole life to think a group of people is icky and gross, you're going to have an icky, gross reaction for some time after you learn that they're actually, there's nothing wrong with a group of people. These things are normal. Just keep on the path and keep yeah. reminding yourself when you have those feelings. Oh, actually I've worked through this before and I remember it. And if it helps go through the logical steps again, and eventually your, your emotional limbic system will catch up with your logical brain. Yeah. Take, take all that on board, Andrew, go off and think about it. Don't, don't try and do everything in one call, call us back. Um, you know, some other week, if you've, if you got questions, let us know how you're doing everything else, but yeah, just genuinely go off and think about it because fears, whether they're rational or irrational, whether they're indoctrinated or, you know, you manage to convince yourself, they don't just vanish instantly. Um, for some people, it's really easy to give things up for me. It was easier than many. I know people who've been out of religion for decades, who still have nightmares of the hell they were indoctrinated. The one they don't believe in, the one they would sit here and say the same things that I say, they would say those same things, and yet they'll still end up with a fear, a, a nightmare of it, because that's what religions do. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I Thanks a lot, Andrew. Appreciate it. Bye, Andrew. <laughs> that's uh, as. Thank you so much. That's, that's a great first call, call, and and we got exactly where we needed to get to there. Um, I want to point out that if you're watching us live today, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's nice. There's loads of people watching and we really appreciate it and also you should try to get that like counter up to 666 because it really annoys some people when it gets nice. it to exactly that number i've been doing that on the hang up and it's it's great we get good screenshots but if you're watching us live you can donate to support this program and other aca programs as well down below the chat there's a donate link 100 of your contributions go directly to the aca they don't stop at google or youtube and well they stop there briefly but they don't take uh, 200 dollars out of it or anything like that you can also, if you are interested, uh, get yourself some AEN merchandise. And for those who aren't familiar with AEN, that's the Atheist Experience Network. And so you can go to tiny.cc slash merchaca uh, to get yourself some coffee cups and mugs and t-shirts and all kinds of things over there. You can become a member on YouTube as well for a very nominal fee, which will get you out of slow mode. So if you've ever been sitting there desperate to chat at somebody and were frustrated by slow mode, uh, that will get you out of it. It'll also get you some custom icons and things. You can also go to patreon.com slash the atheist ex or atheist experience uh, to join our Patreon there and contribute that way. There are a couple of Facebook groups that we like to promote here. These are the atheist experience on un uh, unofficial or the Atheist Experience fan group. And then there's the Atheist Experience private fan group there as well. And there's a an unofficial Discord. And after this program's over, Arden and myself will be there uh, to take some extra questions from people in the community. Uh, gotta love the Discord stuff. Me too. So how much did you struggle with hell? I mean, you and I put up a video and we talked about your past with religion and everything else. Uh, varying people, I think it's worth hitting this and, and you, you brought up a great point. Um, but like for me, it was like, whew, okay, I'm done with that. And it happened really quickly, but it, there was a long buildup to it happening quickly. Did sure. you struggle with hell? Do you, do you still struggle with thoughts of hell? No, hell wasn't as much of a struggle for me. I, I feel like there were other aspects of religious indoctrination that like I was saying, like even even as a trans person, there were like, oh, like trans people are icky thoughts and like the, oh, like this group is bad and this group is good thoughts that I feel like those those kind of lingered a lot longer. So it wasn't necessarily hell, but it was one of, you know, many of the countless other ways that were indoctrinated that those things tended to linger. So like, I, I know that like the fear of hell is a really common one, but I think there's there's so many things, you know, that religion indoctrinates you with that are irrational and not based in reality and they can all impact you in that same way yep i know for me i didn't think so um but there was a lot of not a lot there there was a noticeable baggage related to sex and sexuality left over from religion um some of it i've been finding even within the last year or so 
And this is something that, you know, I've been hosting this show for 16 years and I've been on psychosexuality. For anybody who thinks I've got like all my shit together, uh, well, Arden can attest to the fact that I don't. Now he's a mess. Hot mess. But yeah. We've got uh, Sam in, uh, is that New England? Are you there, Sam? Welcome to the show. How can we help? Uh, it's actually Nebraska. Nebraska. I just saw an E and my brain shut off. So welcome. Sorry for getting your state wrong. Oh, it's all good. Um, This is kind of something that's been on my mind a lot. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of research on this topic, but um, I'm just... I, I know this is not really, I, I know you call it, you would call it an argument from ignorance fallacy. I'm trying to reconstruct it in a different way. But basically, if you think about how the universe functions on the basis that it absolutely has no edge or it's absolutely infinite, you cannot assess that it could exist on natural laws. So we have to, by default, go, okay. If it's not natural, science can explain it. It must be supernatural. Yeah, that's that's all flawed. Like, first of all, you just because you don't know Planetary. don't know the limits of the universe doesn't mean that the universe has no limits. And if it if it doesn't have a limit, I don't know how you can reach the conclusion that that cannot exist on natural laws, um, because we don't necessarily understand all of nature. And so if the if there's something that we don't understand, something that's unknown, then you cannot make declarations about it. You can't say, oh, there is no natural explanation. How did you determine that there's no natural explanation just because there's not one right now? Well, how can one possibly exist? I mean, you think... No, 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 that's not what I asked. What I asked was... How can you determine that there is no natural explanation just because you don't have one now? That is a fallacy. Well, that that's the point I was making because you can't you can't assess basically that it's it's we we just can't explain it. You can't just shrug it off. Now. Say oh it you, you can't explain it now. How do you know what we'll know in 100 years or 1000 years? See, this is the this is the problem with basically argument from ignorance fallacies and God of the gaps fallacies. It presumes that we are in a position now where we have a complete understanding of the universe, which we know isn't true. So it not only is it fallacious to reach that conclusion, but it's stupidly fallacious because all of us would acknowledge we don't know everything. And so if we acknowledge we don't know everything, then you cannot say that because we don't have an explanation for X now, Therefore, the explanation is not natural. That is simply fallacious. Now, it could turn out that the explanation is not natural, but the time to believe that is when there's a demonstration that it's not natural. Well, I wasn't assessing that it was like God. I said supernatural. I said... I, did, I, think, I think, Sam, if you go back and rewind what my response, I don't think you'll hear me mention the word God one time. So why would you? Because that's where you're going to. You're trying to say no, it. no, no, sir, oh, Sam. I did it. No, sir, Sam. I wasn't trying to go to a god, and I didn't accuse you of trying to get to God. I addressed your statement with the words and concepts that you presented, and instead of responding, yes, that's correct, or I have a good rebuttal, you instead tried to spin it as if I was talking about a god. I didn't mention a god. I didn't try to mention a god. I don't want to mention a god. I talked about a fallacy. Am I wrong? Yeah, but that's what you were, you were, you didn't say it, but that's the, that's am I okay. The direction. Uh, Sam, you are now in the dishonest interlocutor category because I keep asking you where I'm wrong. And you keep going back to say that I was trying to, to work a God into it. That's not true. Would you like to continue a conversation or would you like to be knocked off the show? I mean, can you at least explain what I wasn't honest about? I mean, uh, I have explained what you weren't honest about. Every time I've asked you a question, you've failed to answer that question, and you've repeatedly accused me accused me of doing something I didn't do. What I said is, it is fallacious to pre to to assume that because we don't have an explanation now, that therefore there isn't a natural explanation. Am I wrong? 
no, you're not wrong. There you go. Let's see if we do better here with uh, an atheist. Aiden in Florida has questions about dealing with family members. So welcome, Aiden. That was that took an interesting turn. Um, <laughs> hello to both of you. Yeah, I just am looking for um, some some advice. I don't know if I don't know how easy or hard this will be, um, but I'll give you backstory for like thirty seconds. But it pertains to the question. Um, throughout my childhood, my father was in and out of prison. Um, in around middle school, he went to prison, and uh, my mother divorced him, and we moved to a different state. He unfortunately took his own life shortly thereafter. Um, now, as I grew up going through high school. I, uh, because of the show mainly, deconverted, and the rest of my family, my mom, my brother, uh, we went to live with my grandparents on her side. Everybody else was religious, devout Christians. Um, so what I'm calling about basically is when I go and I visit, I'm in college now, uh, but when I go and I visit and I come home, they know I'm an atheist. And they aren't hostile, but they try to convince me to go to church. They question me. I feel that they look at me through some, like, tainted lens because of what I believe, or I guess what I reject. Um, and I guess my question for you is part of me feels that I need to explain myself. Uh, so they respect me a little more. Um, but part of me, part of me feels bad because I see what my family has gone through and especially my mom and how much religion has done for her. And I don't want to like rip that away from her or make her feel a certain way. So I guess I'm just wondering how far do you think I can go or should go in a scenario like that? Is there any advice you could give me? You know, Aiden, whenever people come with kind of this kind of question and not just on shows like these, like in general, I, I always find it funny because they'll do this thing where they'll say, just like you did, where you say, you know, I don't want to take this thing away from my mom because it helps her, but it's really important to me that I fix this relationship and I don't know what to say to her. And I'm always like, what you just, you just gave the perfect example right there. You should tell your mom, hey, look, I, I really care about you. I care about our relationship. I, I want this to work. And I'm not trying to tell you what you can or can't believe. Uh, but like, it's important for me going forward for our relationship that we have a conversation and come to some sort of common understanding about what my boundaries are on this. Like you you nailed it right there. Uh, I I don't really think you need to add much more to that. Um, I, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I, one thing I jotted, I try to take notes because we're, we're trying to make sure we, we deal with the gap in time and interruptions a little, a little better. And the first thing I noted was you were talking about your, what, what kind of things could you say that would make them respect you more? And I don't know your, your mom. I don't know your family. I don't know how fundamentalist they are versus liberal. I don't know their theology, but I doubt there's any argument you could make for being an atheist that may necessarily makes anybody respect you more. Um, and what I found and my family is going to be different from yours, but, and I've had arguments with my family. I've talked about them on the show. I've received birthday cards that I've read on the show that, you know, are, are awful. Um, my parents are still curiously proud of me for, you know, not being in prison and not being awful and all, all the other things that parents are generally pr proud of their kids for. Um, there's nothing that's going to make my parents respect my atheism or respect the fact that I'm an atheist because in their mind, I'm working for Satan and I'm leading people to hell. Um, and there's nothing about that that they can respect. The things about me that they can respect are that, you know, how I'm a decent person, how I work, you know, do good things. It, it, those are things uh, they can respect about my character that's independent from the atheism. So rather than looking for what you should address with regard to atheism, I agree with Arden. Address who you are, who they are, and what your relationship means. And if, and then if they want to have a conversation, like, I just don't understand how you can not believe this, then you can have those conversations. And I would argue, right. um, and, and this is going to sound strange, especially coming from me and some people's perception of the show, although I think largely it fits. First Peter 3.15 encourages all Christians to be prepared at all times to give a reason for the faith that's within them and to do so with gentleness and kindness. I think that we can, I think that's a good message, uh, even for atheists, which is not to go knocking on doors necessarily and, hey, have you stopped believing Jesus or let me take this, you know, take your faith away from you. But to be prepared enough to say, here's why I don't believe in a God, um, and not, God, you're stupid for believing in a God. 
I, that just, I mean, that, I don't see how that's productive at all. And you have a huge advantage right now because you're talking to your mom. And unless your mom is some kind of super weirdo, your mom loves you so much and is already wanting to be on your side about everything. It makes those conversations. I had a six hour argument with my mom that was as off the rails as anything you've heard from callers on here. My mom still loves me. My mom got came up to me the next day and she's like, I thought some more about what you said. And I think what you're, what you mean is that um, I start by believing that the Bible is true and you don't have that belief. So you would need to be convinced that the Bible is true first. And I was like, yes, there was like a, some moment of breakthrough because all she ever wanted to do was reference the Bible, which I already knew better than she did. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Arden. And I think, I think you're going to be okay. Aiden, and I wouldn't worry about it too much, but I think your mom's on your side. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, you know, I'm down here in Florida going to college and I have a, I'm a licensed pilot. I'm going to be an airline pilot. They're tremendously proud oh, wow. of me. It really, I, I know they love me. They tell me they love me. I just, when we get on those topics, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm gay. That whole thing is another, that they could be another call or something, but stuff like that where they say they love me and they're proud of me. I, I feel that they're sincere, but I, I know they're, their beliefs. And so I guess that just makes it hard, but I think that's good advice just to focus on the stuff that I'm doing that, you know, their support of me and not focus so much on the, the religion, the disconnect that we have there. Yeah, definitely. I, and I, I hear you Aiden. like, I, I had multiple conversations with my family where I know they love me, but I know there's there because of their beliefs, there's some sort of disjoint in, in how they support me and that they don't, they'll call me she her but they won't necessarily actually see me as a woman or something along those lines and and that's frustrating sometimes but i i think sometimes i think we build these conversations up to be a lot scarier in our head than they actually are in real life and i think a lot of people actually really appreciate being given the opportunity to honestly set boundaries you know when you sit down and you say that like like you'd said, like, I, I want to keep this relationship with you. I don't want to tell you how to believe or what to think. I just want us to have an easier time navigating this relationship. How do we do that together? Um, I, I think a lot of people being given that autonomy and respect as an individual to like work together like that will be even more uh, uh, charitable in hearing you out um, and working towards that together. But it's definitely scary. It doesn't make it any less intimidating. And I, I wish you the best in doing that. I, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I don't want to preach, but you know, the show is basically what caused me to question my beliefs and eventually deconvert. So um, Matt and everybody, I, I really appreciate it. This is, you know, the show's changed my life. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Aiden. I really appreciate it. I got to let you go. Cause we've got like, uh, have, uh, I don't know, a ton more calls we want to get to today. Uh, but I'm glad it was useful and, and call us back. Let us know how it goes. Cause there are plenty of other people that are in your situation um, that would benefit from hearing your story. And somebody in chat just said, Oh, look, another gay pilot. And so evidently there's plenty of gay pilots that might be in your situation <laughs> and would like to hear that story as well. So. Awesome. Yeah. They all seem to go to America and there's too many of us for some reason. Well, that's <laughs> the answer earlier. My dad just retired from. So thanks a lot, Aiden. Appreciate it. Good luck, Aiden. We, uh, uh, there's some more stuff to announce because there's always more stuff to announce. So in, in addition to those Facebook groups that I already promoted, there's also an atheist versus theist debate group that you can find out about. The information's up on your screen. XP fan debates are there as well. And in addition to this program, the ACA produces a bunch of other programs. You might have seen Talk Heathen earlier today where objectively Dan was on with Mandisa and it was outstanding. And in between Talk Heathen and the Atheist Experience is the flagship show, or so Johnny would have you believe, of the Atheist Community of Austin. And that's the nonprofit Sundays at three with new hosts, including our own Me. Arden I was just on it earlier today. You should go watch. Yeah, you should definitely go watch. Uh, the If you weren't familiar with these other programs and you want to find out more about them, you can go to tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts. That is your one-stop shop for all of the ACS Community of Austin programs. Uh, great, great resource there and a way to introduce yourself to not only new shows, new topics, new people, new personalities. So if you've just been sitting here for 16 years, just listening to me, 
what the fuck are you doing? What's wrong with you? There's all these other people. Like I have to, I had to bring Arden on this show just so that, oh no, you, you already, oh, you already knew about nonprofits and Arden was like, well, then good. You're, you're on the good list. We like you. We like all of you. And the people we like the most, sorry, as much as I love the people in chat and the people who are working and watching the shows, the people I love the most are these people who make these shows happen every oh, yeah. stinking week, all the time in there. That way we could just show up and talk and it's nice and easy. And they're doing all this work. There is a lot that's going on in the atheist community of Austin across all the shows. And one of my new favorite segments is coming up right now, which is letting you take a look at what you may have missed on other ACA shows. Because, you know, when you have some sex toys it, and they get kind of old and when you start pulling them out, you're like, I don't think I can use this anymore. Cool. Kind of and drinking stuff. babies. Yeah. Dr <laughs> drinking babies. Right. A nice, refreshing glass of babies. Now, I guess that would fall into the atheist mythos there. Homosexuals getting married just destroys Christianity or something. Like somehow they're coming to attack you. They didn't invite you to the wedding. Maybe these people are still like upset about that. Christy, I'm gonna give you a safe word, okay? <laughs> sure. and, and 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 if that's all right, and and the the safe word is pumpkin. I got a I got a pumpkin out. I got a pumpkin, pumpkin. out. Thank you, Kevin. We have all vaginas sure. again. There is gonna be so much. Next week is just gonna be clubs of me and you saying vagina. <laughs> A vagina. Mental vagina. Mental vagina. Vagina. Yeah. Vagina. 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 Chat. Vagina. <laughs> Don't say vaginas. Vagina. Mine and <laughs> Jenna's mental vagina. Wait. Vagina. 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 My mental vagina. Crow. Vagina. And just for you, for your birthday. Yeah. Vagina. <laughs> Vagina. Vagina. Yeah. Amazing. It's a uh, vagina, 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 vagina. I wonder if we could do something like there, there's that old thing with the word Buffalo, where you can form a sentence just by saying the word Buffalo over and over again, because you can talk, talk about the animal, the place the you know, what you're doing, et cetera. So you can be like Buffalo, 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 Buffalo. I wonder if you could right. do something that probably couldn't do the same thing with vagina, but Shannon sure did try. <laughs> it was beautiful. Some, maybe someone will make like a like a music remix of that. That would be really cool. I think. Oh yes, somebody's starting to work on that. The second they this this goes out over the air and they heard you say it, uh, we have Hank in Texas, uh, and he wants to talk to us about non-human animals and the existence of God. So welcome, Hank. How can we help? Hey man, how's it going? Pretty good. Hey Arden, how are you? Doing good. Thanks, Hank. What's up? What's your question? or your topic. Uh, can I first say, hey, Matt, have you ever seen American Idol on TV by chance? American Idol? Yes. Uh, you are like the Simon Cowell of atheists because <laughs> even those people that don't like can't wait to hear what you got. Well, thank you. Uh, That's my favorite thing anyone's ever said. Thank you, Hank. That was a gift. Yes, I'm pretty sure I will be hearing a, a Simon Cowell reference at, like at some point later this week, especially if I mentioned Judy. Oh my God. Anyway, thank you so much, Hank. Uh, you, so for, you're getting ready to tell us how you think non human animals I don't know, somehow prove the existence of God. Is that right? Uh, I think it indicates that, Matt. I, uh, let me say I discovered your program several months ago. And I debate climate change online a lot and found your program has really helped me focus my arguments and the subject. Uh, but somewhat incredibly to me, as I've been thinking about uh, focusing on the subject and everything, I have actually found other reasons that I think there is a God because I was hanging on by a thread at one time when I first called in, uh, thinking consciousness was was it, and yeah. come up with two or three things. But right now, you mentioned in passing the other day something about uh, slavery of other species. Uh, you didn't elaborate on it, but uh, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about 
the slavery of other species. I don't recall mentioning slavery of other species um, because I don't view our interactions with other species as slavery. Can I, can I ask real quick, I, I want to I make sure we get to this, um, but when you say you debate climate change, and we're not going to go into a climate change debate here, I just wanted to know, um, are you debating that climate change is real or that is not real? Absolutely. I have children and gen- grandchildren I'm extremely worried about. Cool. Okay. So uh, my view on uh, hu- humans is, and, and other animals um, is that we are essentially stewards of the planet, and but primarily with a focus on how it all impacts us. Um, so I don't view having pets as slavery the way some on, on the far, far left might do. Uh, I know that some of the animal rights organizations view any sort of uh, having a pet as slavery. I don't, I don't view it that way. Uh, I am concerned about the way we treat animals, certainly concerned about factory farming and things like that, uh, and cruelty towards animals and stuff like that. Um, but I would never put it in the same category as slavery. Um, but anyway, you, you said you you were thinking on this and came up with something where the existence of other animals somehow demonstrates or makes a God more likely. So let, let's sort that out. Okay. Uh, I was thinking more of since we own animals and they do our bidding and work, that I thought of it as slavery after it was just mentioned, I, I'm, you know, at one time, and I started thinking about it. Uh, and it bothered me at first that I couldn't come up with a good reason for why we should be able to even do that to other species. I'll call it enslave them, but whatever name we want to use for it. Because I didn't want to say that we were superior to other species, since I don't like using that word with other races or anything. I found it completely objectionable. But it finally dawned on me that I really do think we are superior to the other species. Uh, and for that reason, it, it gives us the allowance to what I would call enslave them, make them do our bidding and stuff, as long as we treat them humanely. And since I think that, for me, it was excuse me, it was a kind of a short trip to think there's, if we're superior to the other animals, then something superior to humans might exist. And I saw that for me as indication there might be a God. What do you think? Okay. Um, So, I think it's easy and okay to say we're superior to other animals as long as you're going to say in this particular category, like I'm smarter than a chicken. I'm not faster than a cheetah. I'm not, you know, kinder than a bonobo or whatever. It, it, you have to do it with the recognition that we're being very human centric and biased when we start picking the categories and under which we're going to be the superior ones. When you talk about, humans using other animals yes we do that probably more and better than anybody else but there are plenty of uh relationships where uh animals cooperate and work together or leverage other animals to do their work for them and there are plenty of animals that are, that use tools so the fact that we're in this position where currently we're, we probably our tool use is better than any other animal I, I think that's just an objective fact and that we are more likely to use animals for our benefit, not just for food, but I mean, as work animals, et cetera, uh, more proficiently than other animals have shows that we're better at that, but better at X doesn't mean better. And even if it did mean that we were better kind of universally, I don't know how that gets us to therefore there's a God or there's likely a God. What are you thinking, Arden? I mean, it, well, I definitely agree that it doesn't get us anywhere near the the, uh, the existence of a god and i think in terms of like our superiority to animals like i i think so like we sure we use animals for for like work and stuff like that like a, a livestock or something but there's also the factor that even if we decided to stop using animals for as livestock for like 
work or whatever, um, they're all domesticated. It's not like we can just release those animals back into the wild. Like they're our responsibility now. We have to take care of those animals. They've, we've caused them to evolve in a direction where they rely on humans to survive for the most part, or at least in some, in some uh, regard. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have a justification to use animals because we're superior to them. I think we have a, we have an obligation to take care of animals because we've caused them to be dependent on us. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you could make the case that our use of animals isn't a demonstration that we're superior, but that we're a demonstration that we're inferior. Like we can't get along yeah. without exploiting them for our benefit. And Absolutely. if you looked at it and in the terms of exploiting them for our benefit, there's nothing about that that is good in the sense of moral or righteous. It is good in the sense that it benefits us. But I don't know what, how, how does that get us to a God, Hank? Or even likely a God? Like I said, Matt, uh, I, I was thinking some of the things you said I haven't thought about, but I was thinking more of we dominate animals. Nope, there's not any other animals that dominate humans. And that's where I kind of came up with us being superior to the animals. And like I said, it, it was a short step for me to say if there is kind of a hierarchy of animals as far as dominating, as far as humans dominating other animals uh, that I call superior, then maybe there's uh, something superior to humans. That I, I get that. Was on. But then even, even then, wouldn't you be like hinting at the potential for there to exist an animal that's superior to humans, not, not a, supernatural entity I, I i don't see where that yeah stems. when our alien overlords arrive and turn <laughs> us into slaves then you'll right. find the next most dominant species i i get it it's natural <laughs> what what you're doing hank is is something very similar to what human beings have done throughout history which is hey i see a human and i see another human and this human is faster than that human and so maybe there's a fastest human Maybe there's a smartest human. Maybe there's a fastest being or a smartest being that isn't human. It's a natural progression. However, if we're going to say that that thing exists, that there's something beyond us, um, is it using us too? Like, if you're in order for your your kind of analogous argument or analogous argument to, to work. You would say, ah, look, we humans dominate other animals, therefore we are superior to us. And it seems plausible that maybe there's a being who is similar to us, which as Arden pointed out, you still didn't get to supernatural or God, but wouldn't that also suggest that they are using us? And if our use of animals can be viewed as in our benefit, but not necessarily a moral good, then whatever being is using us, if we figure it out, that doesn't mean that they're good, right? Uh, I agree. Hadn't thought of that, but I, yeah, that doesn't mean they're good. Yep. And right now, not only does it not mean that they're good, we also don't know that it means they exist. So while I can follow your reasoning down to, wow, that would be a possible, that could be a likely, whatever else, uh, I don't see any evidence for it. And, um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. It was. I'm always interested in what you think about about things because uh, other people often have ideas that I certainly don't think about. Yep. I appreciate it, Hank. We're going to let you go because i got a bunch of other calls to get before we run out of time, but we appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, Hank. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that Hank's an honest interlocutor. I feel like we, we got a lot of people on other sides of arguments, whether it's here or transatlantic or wherever, and you know, you can point out to them where their reasoning is flawed and they'll just say, okay, well, how about this other argument then? They'll just jump yeah. ship when at least Hank's willing to say, oh yeah, okay, I didn't think about that. Yeah, and I think that's great in the sense that there's plenty of things that I haven't thought about. You're going to come up with stuff yeah. I haven't thought about. I'm going to come up with stuff you haven't thought about. That's the whole point of having these conversations. You and I have had conversations where I, I expected like, oh, we, we'll start talking about something. I was like, oh, this is going to be like, long and complicated and maybe have to tiptoe and then one or the other of us will say something and we'll just be like oh yeah and light bulbs click so, yep in, in a metaphorical sense i don't actually just sit here and turn the lights on off and on but i will next time you're over i'll just okay good. mess with the switch 
I mean, it's your electricity bill, not mine. So <laughs> fair point. Robert Norgan has philosophical arguments for God. So uh, welcome, Robert. I'll, I'll do my best to take notes and uh, tell you what I think. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, so the reason for my call is a while back there was a call in that said, why don't you believe in God by faith? And Matt, you argued from a foundational epistemology that faith lacked evidence. So you can't have a belief based on faith. Well, the caller didn't do a very good job of defending himself. So I um, looked up this argument. Uh, a little bit of history. In 1877, W.K. Clifford argued in the ethics of police that it's immoral to believe things for which one lacks evidence. And I think he would agree with that. However, in The Will to Believe, William James published in 1896 a defense of belief without prior evidence. Now, I'm not, that's not my argument. Yeah, let's just skip past the history and get to the actual argument because I got like eight other callers. And while well, I appreciate the fact that there are people who are going to agree and disagree on either sides, we're not getting any closer to the argument by, by going through the past. Okay, um, my argument then is based on Reformed epistemology. Reformed epistemology was clearly articulated in papers called Faith and Rationality, edited by Alvin Plantica yes. and Wolstoff in, in 1983. So I, I still don't need a history lesson. I'm familiar with Plantica and his modologic ontological argument. Can and reformed epistemology, which I'm already going to object to. Can you just present the argument? Okay. Uh, simply the argument is, it is belief in God is properly basic and therefore doesn't require evidence. And I reject that because I also don't accept that there are things that are properly basic. I think that's a mistake within uh, philosophical ideas, but even to the extent that something could be uh, properly basic, I don't see how belief in a God could be properly basic. And the closest anybody's ever come is to talk about something like the census divinatus, where you have a divine sense, but you can't demonstrate that that's actually real. And so if you're saying that belief in God is properly basic, you are not making an argument. You are not presenting any evidence. You are not even demonstrating anything with sound epistemology. You're just saying it is intrinsically obvious and unnecessary to defend the notion that God necessarily exists, and I reject that wholeheartedly. Well, then you must reject uh, classical foundationalism. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Then I, I'm a proponent of, of something that Susan Hawk dubbed found herentism because I think it's not that I reject foundationalism out of hand. Foundationalism has its problems. Coherentism has its problems. We haven't gotten to a full on, uh, here's the one true epistemology, which is why we can still uh, argue and disagree about it. But classical foundationalism, I'm not a proponent of. I'm, but I'm, I, I'm far more in line with, with that than I am with planning as reformed epistemology. Because any, any epistemology that comes in and says, hey, there exists a God and this does not have to be defended is... Uh, well, anything that can be asserted without evidence can be rejected without evidence, uh, to paraphrase Christopher Hitchens. And so I reject his reformed epistemology and this. And so there's, you're not presenting an argument for the existence of God. You're presenting an argument for why you don't have to have an argument for the existence of God. That's true. Um, and I'm not interested in that argument because I don't buy it. And I don't know why anybody would. So what, if, what, if, what if people came to you with other things that they believed in? and said, here's a reason why I don't have to defend this position, and you should accept it too. Well, let's, let's take, for example, somebody come up, comes up and says, white is not black. You don't have to have evidence for that. That's not an epistemology. That is a matter of definition. There's a difference between synthetic beliefs. Sorry, what? That's foundationalism. Well, I think you're, I think you're category, you're, you're making category mistakes 
Um, because like there's a difference between synthetic and analytic propositions. But what you described isn't so much foundationalism that white isn't black. Uh, that's just a matter of definition that white is this and however, and we could define white and we could define black because those are just words in ways that are different. So instead of worrying about the words, if we're worrying about the concepts, the thing that we're pointing to when you and I say white in English normatively um, has a definition that makes it in simple set theory distinct from black. White is not black because identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. There's nothing about that that says, here's why I don't have to prove what white is or that white exists. And that's what planning is doing. And the word. Well, we understand the words, and that is a basic, um, a basic belief because we understand. No. No, the fact that white is not black is not a properly basic belief. Not, not, okay. I, it, it's, so, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it's not a properly basic belief, but let's set all that aside because it does not matter whether it's a properly basic belief or not. I don't accept that God is a properly basic belief, even if the properly basic belief has some useful, uh, so, some use. I don't think it does, but I definitely don't accept that a God is one. And to me, this is just a way of avoiding having to show that you have a reasonable belief. Do you have, do you believe there is something that you believe in that's a priori? Sure, but I don't, I, I don't know how any of this is relevant because if your position as you've already says, said it is, is that God is a properly basic belief, then we have nothing to discuss because I'm not convinced it's properly basic and you're not going to convince me it's properly basic. And even if you could convince me it's properly basic, there's a problem with properly basic beliefs. So what difference does it make if I have a priori, a priori beliefs? I have both, as does anybody. And, and what my particular beliefs are, aren't relevant. If, if the point is to show that we have a sound, a sound reason to believe that a God exists. Saying, I don't need to provide a reason why God exists because God is, is obvious and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a properly basic belief. That's not an argument. It's not, an, it's not evidence. It is a way to avoid the argument evidence. Okay, so my final comment is... Um, from Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein. Do you have a Do you have a final comment that comes from your own brain, or are you just going to quote people? Because I'm I'm less interested in quotes than I am in what you think. I you're not going to impress me or anybody else by quoting Wittgenstein or anybody else. Do you have a final thought from you? Yeah, we're in two different religious. We're in re, religious language. And you're in not in a religious language, so you don't, you don't. We, I guess um, I, I'm I'm willing to uh, say that epistemic fear is going to agree to disagree. Just where okay. not in. Well, thank you for ending the call with one of the phrases that I despise the most. Because when you say, let's agree to disagree, I definitely do agree that we disagree. But the phrase, let's agree to disagree, suggests that there's no pathway to figure out which one of us is right. And that is another attempt to avoid demonstrating that you're actually correct. And that's why my epistemology is going to be superior to yours. Because everything that I'm convinced is true, Thank I, you can, I can, Thank I can, I can, what, what's that, Robert? Thank you. Oh, you don't want to hear. Want to you don't want to listen to that. Okay. Well, goodbye then, Robert. Um, the thing I, is, everything that I believe is true, I can demonstrate with, an, with, with, with the same level of epistemic justification that would allow Robert to accept it. Robert believes things that aren't believed by other people and has to come up with a new type of epistemology. I'm sorry. Right. You had something I guess to say. The, it was just, yeah, I don't understand why anyone would, would use. I, I've never heard of properly basic beliefs. I'm, I'm not like a huge philosophy junkie or anything. I've had a few philosophy courses, but I'm not super well-read or anything. I just don't understand what the purpose would be because if 
you're a Christian and your goal is to, you know, convert other people towards Christianity and, uh, you know, make your God known to people. Why would you not, like, how could you not try to convince them using evidence? Because, like, if, I, if God isn't obvious to me, then I need you to give me something. And if you're just saying it's obvious and that's it, then I... <laughs> I, I don't know. That's uh, yeah. it. Just feels pretty useless um, as like a. And this is why I, I this is why I went ahead and just it kind of took over and did that call because. Let's assume for for this for the case and and audience bear with me for one minute and then we'll get on to another call. Let's assume that in fact God is a properly basic belief that it's just obvious and doesn't need any justification. Now, what does that say? about the world that we inhabit. If in fact God exists and it's, and belief in him is properly basic, then everybody who's arguing for any sort of evidence for a God is ridiculous. And the, if, if this is properly basic and everybody should just accept this, you know, as, as an a priori properly basic belief, then why is God hiding? What reason could God possibly have to not come down and say, Yep, believing in me is obvious as anything you could imagine. So here I am. Let me talk to you. It it is one of those things that when you have a thinking agent that is not bound by space and time and claim that this is properly basic, when the properties of this being are some that you can't even demonstrate are possible, nothing beneficial to this audience is ever going to come out of it. There are philosophical discussions that are going to be beneficial that Robert could be a part of as soon as he stops quoting everybody that he fancies and actually starts thinking for himself. Yeah, that's uh, probably one of the only reasons why I feel like I'm not inspired to read philosophy because every philosophy junkie I know does that. It's, uh, it, is, it is interesting. We have, uh, and I'm, I apologize in advance for mispronouncing this name, um, we're, we should probably work on putting a phonetic pronunciation next to some of these, but... Is it Rivalod in Netherlands or Rivalod? Yes, Rivalod. Rivalod, welcome. Thank you so much for calling. How can we help? Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I basically have a question. It's regarding morality and atheism. How can atheists be moral in the absence of uh, a god? How, Arden, how can you be moral in the absence of a god? Well, I have a brain and I have empathy and I know when people hurt me, it feels shitty and I don't want to hurt other people because then I assume that they feel shitty. It's also not advantageous for me to hurt people because I that I would gain a reputation for being a shitty person and people probably wouldn't allow me to participate in society in the way that I need to. Uh, there, there's a lot of... Uh, different reasons that you do moral things uh my moral compass is uh harm or like harm reduction and uh what uh causing like good and human flourishing yeah um, one of the yeah. things to point out is that atheism isn't the lack of existence of god it's the lack of belief in a god and i i've argued uh, i wonder how some people can be moral with the presence of a belief in a god because depending on which god they believe in um, the various gods advocate for things or supposedly advocate for things that are immoral. For example, within the Bible, uh, if if the God of the Bible is real and true, then the God of the Bible sanctions slavery and the God of the Bible sanctions women being inferior to men and not being allowed to own property and other things that have done that. If you go to other religions, you're going to find different models of God where I have moral <laughs> objections to them. So I would say, I don't want to, I don't want to, just shrug this off, but if you Google superiority of secular morality, you can find uh, a couple different versions of a talk that I gave about how the secular moral system that I advocate for is uh, vastly superior to any that is put forward by any religion. But I think the question I have to ask you um, is how are you defining what is moral? Because if you say morality is that which agrees with the mind of God, and I say Yep. morality is that which uh, impacts the well-being of thinking creatures, then clearly we don't mean the same thing by morality. So what do you mean by morality? Well, well I basically, you know, uh, the way I define morality is whatever God says something 
is right. Okay. If your so if your definition of morality is whatever God says is right, how do we know what God has said? Um, well, I mean that's yeah, that's another question. I mean, well, uh, yes, th that's why I asked it. I'm aware it's another question. Also, I'm saying, I'm saying, if your definition of morality is that which God says is moral is moral. My next question is, how do we know what God has said? Because I'm not aware that there is a God. I don't believe there's one. And I'm not aware that any God has ever said anything to any human being. So how could we make a list of, make a list of things that you know, for, that, list, name one thing that you know God said and how you know God said it. One thing. One thing. Um... Well, I mean, he has said a lot of things, but I mean, uh, if if you take one thing, it's uh, you know uh, kindness and you know being good to to other humans. Okay, so yeah. I asked you. Sum that up. I, I asked you to name one thing that you know God has said, and how you know God said it, and then you said he said a lot of things, which I could have predicted you would say, and then you said kindness. How do you know that God said kindness? Well, if I want to get real deep, I don't actually know. I mean, there you go. And neither do I. And so if you're going to define morality as something God said, and you don't know what God said, then you have no morality, which means of the two of us, I should be asking you, how can you possibly be moral when your definition of morality is something that you acknowledge you cannot attain at all? It, and doesn't it kind of scare you, Rivalad, that your right. your compass is whatever God says? Because what what if you became convinced that God said killing your mother was moral? Would you then feel okay about going and killing your mom, or would you have a reservation about that? I suspect you'd probably not be too comfortable with that, right? Like that that seems like well, not a good if, compass if God to have. That comes down from let's say God appears in front of me and he says do X, I would actually do it because. If he's all knowing, oh yikes! No better than me, right? That's scary. Well, I, I, I find sure that is the type of thing that people will say. However, neither you nor me have any example of any god ever coming down and saying do X. And so, until that happens, at a minimum, you have no moral foundation, which means you are at necessarily an amoral creature with no hope of morality because you've based your hope, your, your moral foundation on something that has not happened and that you can't demonstrate happened. You might as well be saying your morality is whatever Fergal Burgle Minergal Burgle says. I'm sorry? Yeah. It, it's a word I made up specifically for this purpose. Okay. So of the two of us, I have an actual moral foundation that I can point to. And it's, it's not um, it doesn't cover everything. It is growing. It is changing. It is based on notions of well-being. Arden has a foundation that is based on harm reduction. While the two of us aren't going to agree on everything related to morality, at least the two of us can have a conversation about our foundations and say, here's where I think this one edges it out, or here's why I think this one edges it out. And, and I think we, we can come to agreement. The same thing by our... We, we may. We may find that my concern about well-being is fundamentally identical to her reduction of harm. But at least we can have a conversation about morality. You, with your foundation, cannot do that. I, I admit, I mean, I have a belief. I don't have the hardcore proof, you know, that, you know, the, these things come from a God. But that's where I believe a belief, you know, you need to have some belief, you know, and, and, uh, Why? In my opinion, Why? For, uh, something higher. Why? Otherwise, otherwise, what's the purpose of life? I'm just, you know. Well, not so th that's a different question. Uh, what's the purpose of life, to use your own phrase? Um, what do you think the purpose of life is? Because I don't think the purpose of life has anything to do with a God. I don't think there is any externally imposed purpose. I think my life has whatever purpose and meaning I give it. But, but wouldn't that be arbitrary? Like, it could be whatever? It, it, it is not necessarily arbitrary, but is it subjective? Yes. The, 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 the meaning and purpose of my life is mine. Why would I want it any other way? Would you like to be born 
and have everything laid out for you. Here's who you're going to marry. Here's what job you're going to do. Everything dictated by somebody else. Would you want to live in a world like that? No, not not not, not by another human being, no. Well, why, why then, if you wouldn't want it dictated by another human being, would you want it dictated by a God who you can't even demonstrate is real? I would not mind it be dictated by God because he would know. That's sad. So. That is absolutely sad that in any other circumstance, if the government or your parents or a human being told you what the purpose of your life was, you would start a revolution. But as soon as someone tells you that a God that you have never met, can't identify, can't show exists, as soon as somebody tells you that that God has a purpose for you, all of a sudden you're okay with that. I find that to be one of the most saddening and maddening things I've ever heard. And I've heard it many times. Why are you okay with the notion that some God out there views you as a plaything and that you don't, he doesn't want you to have free will, doesn't want you to be the governor of your life. Why is that okay? I mean, I mean, the way that I think about it, like if I, if there is a God and he knows everything, I, I don't see it's for, right for me to say, I know better than you because he would have an infinite amount of knowledge. So how can I tell him? Oh, I didn't say anything about knowing more than a God. How do you know that just because God has a, a plan for you, you, that it's a plan that is actually good for you? That I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot you don't know. And I didn't know it either, which is why I stopped running around acting as if I, if I knew it and acting as if I believed it. Do, do you at least, because I've got to move on to other callers, but do you at least understand how Arden and I can have a foundation for morality and and live a moral life. Um, and those who are advocating for a morality based on God are on questionable footing at best. Yeah, I mean, Arden explained it, you know, you know the, the, the thought pattern there. So it cleared it up a little bit, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I'm still interested in this. So, yeah. I appreciate it. I've got to move on to some other callers, but think think on it some more and give us a call back. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, how on earth can you be moral? It, it is funny you know, to me. I mean, I think it's interesting because, sure, if if there were somebody who knew absolutely everything... And I could be sure of that. And they could tell me this is the path that will lead to like, I don't know, the most happiness or something for you. But by that, I'm even using, I'm assuming that that would be, I don't know. I, I, I could imagine if that were true, then sure, I could I could see where someone's coming from. But if that can't be demonstrated, then uh, why would you listen to what someone says? That's, any, any Joe Blow could walk up to you and say, I know everything and this is the best path for you. And you would be just as on just the same footing as uh, it was with God. So, yeah, you can. Uh, so the, the people behind the scenes can can stick a marker here for this to be cut out. And that's this. I'm supremely confident that there isn't any being that knows everything, because if there was a being that knew everything, they would knew my they would know my sincere desire to know that they knew everything. And they would also understand that as a being myself who cannot know everything, I could never have a rational basis to determine that they, in fact, knew everything. If I'm not capable of knowing everything, how can I know who is? because I would have to have that level of knowledge. And if such a being existed and were moral at all and were good at all and had any interest in me or had any concern about me knowing that it existed, it would know exactly what it would need to do to convince me and everybody else. And it would have already done it. And the fact that that hasn't happened, which I said before, is a demonstration that either that kind of being doesn't exist or that being doesn't want me to know it exists. But in the case of the previous caller, it's a huge assumption to go from, well, maybe there's a God that can serve as a foundation for morality and give my life meaning and purpose. And I'll just go ahead and assume it because if that being exists, it clearly knows everything. Well, first of all, even if it knows more than you, that doesn't mean it knows everything. And even if it knows everything, there's no demonstration that it is working in your best interest. You've assumed right. that there's a being that it wants best, what's best for you, that it knows everything 
that it knows better than you and that it's going to have a plan and purpose for your life. And yet it's not going to communicate with you and tell you what that plan or purpose is. Yeah. And I mean, and what, what standard are we using for what's best for me? Because like, if I want to advance as much as I can in the society that we have, then I would do things very differently than if I'm trying to live a life that makes me happy and fulfilled and, and satisfied. But, so yeah, there's, there's so many moving parts there that it's, it reminds me a, a little bit of the, of the call earlier with, with Hank, with animals, where there's an assumption that just because we're capable of using an animal doesn't, you know, that, that, that somehow that's good. Well, it's definitely good for us. But in your case, um, as, as someone who's trans, if there was a God, then that means that a God had you born a certain way and set you up in this position. And what Christians will often say, like, and, and I, I don't want to equate the two, that's not what I'm doing. Anytime there's something that Christians would view as an obstacle in your path, being trans, being gay, you know, having whatever, God put that there to grow you as a character and needed you. It is a, it's all post hoc rationalization, one after the other after the other, because they can't show that their God exists. And so instead, they're just going to assume the best on behalf of God, no matter what happens to anybody else. Right. Yeah. You know, who cares if that makes you suicidal? It's just a, a good, good challenge. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Thanks, God. You needed to overcome that so that you could really come on the atheist experience and argue against that God. I have uh, Leo in Canada who uh, evidently converted back to being a theist because of something I said. So, wow. Uh, I don't know what I could have ever said that would actually provide evidence to support a reasonable conclusion that a God exists. So I'm, I, I don't want to make an assumption. Leo, what did I say that convinced you, you needed to be a theist? Hi guys. Well, first of all, I love your show. I listen to your show all the time, especially when I go on long drives with my buddy, we put it on the car and we listen to it. We go on, on our trip, two and a half, three hour drive makes the time go by really, really quick. I love you guys. Um, well, basically, I'm on the fence. I'm not really uh, a theist or an atheist. I'm back on the fence again now. I was born, I was brought up actually Christian. Um, and um, listening, listening to your show, you're a very smart guy. I, lo I, love, I love your show. You do a wonderful job explaining things. Leo, then, we're running short on time. Instead of telling me how awesome I am, um, which isn't going to do any of us any good. Let's just get to what I said that convinced you to be a theist. Okay. The one thing that you said that convinced me again is well, you said, even if, if um, God is real and when I do die and I do see God in front of me, you will not worship him. Now, if that would have come from another person, like say a mass murderer, like a Ted Bundy or a, uh, or a Charles Manson, if those guys would have said that, I would have said, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Okay, whatever, you, that's fine. But from you become, being, um, trying to, you know, becoming a minister or after 25 years of being in that, in that environment, you know the Bible inside and out. And then coming from you, I got kind of worried now when you said that. I'm like, really? Like, why? why? So, because, you know the, because you know the consequences of what will happen if you don't worship God. Of, of all the people, you should know it for Leo? sure. Leo, Leo, that's my whole point. Leo, kind of like that's why I'm Leo. Yes, I also know the consequences of what happens if I tell the king to go fuck himself. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't tell a king to go fuck himself. The fact that I could believe that a god exists does not mean that I believe it's worthy of worship. As a matter of fact, I think no being who would demand worship is worthy of it. That to whatever extent worship is deserved. It cannot be something that is expected. And when you, it, I'm specifically talking about the biblical God who advocates for slavery, who hides, is, is winning the world's longest game of hide and go seek, who doesn't like women, who doesn't like homosexuals, who doesn't like trans people. That God is an immoral piece of shit. And if he exists, I definitely wouldn't worship him. I would believe that he existed. And I would be, instead of doing the atheist experience, I would be doing the God is a piece of shit experience. It's explaining how I believe that this God exists and how neither me nor anyone else should worship him. 
despite the consequences. Because if what you're saying is that it's okay to threaten someone with torture, and then you should worship someone who threatens you with torture, I fundamentally disagree. Okay, no, I hear I hear where you're, where you're coming from, but keep in mind, though, like, I think, I'm pretty sure, like, I've, I haven't read the Bible, but as far as I understand that the Bible was written in Greek, so it was in Greek, and so on. Leo? And so forth, and Leo? Maybe, it's possible. Leo, I'm really short on time, and if you haven't read the Bible, stop talking about it. You, you will not do any good here by talking about something you haven't read. I haven't read the Bible. This is true. I haven't read the Bible, but no, I'm listening. I listen to your show. And so I let me ask you, Leo, which God are you on the fence about? Which God are you thinking about worshiping? Well, the, 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 the Christian God. The, the so, so you, you, Leo, are, are, were worried because I said I wouldn't worship a moral monster. And then you, who haven't read the book at all, are thinking about worshiping that moral monster when you don't. Leo, go read. Go study up. Make up your mind. But don't just say, oh, I don't know anything about this, and now I'm on the fence. Because I don't take you seriously when you do that. This was serious for me. I was a fundamentalist Christian for more than 25 years. I was studying to be a minister. I have friends who became ministers and then changed their religion. And they came to me. One of them came to me and said, I don't understand. How can you be an atheist? And I said, I don't understand how you can be a Catholic. We were raised Baptist. We knew the Bible. We knew this. We knew that. And he was like, oh, because I like beer. Oh, well, great then I'm an atheist because I took this shit seriously and you're a Catholic because you didn't. And I still love him. He's still a good friend of mine, but that is just the truth. And Leo, if you're thinking about becoming a theist because you haven't taken this shit seriously, I will not be re never respect that. Well, I know there's plenty of other religions out there that believe in other, other gods. I understand that, but you know, I, I was, like I said, I was brought up as a Christian. And then when I listened to your show, you made perfectly sense that there is no really, there's no really evidence of a God. You cannot prove there's a God. And then that's all I'm saying. All I'm saying is when someone asks you that question, like you would not worship, even if, if God was true, you would not worship. Like, that's all I'm saying to you, uh, Matt. And I don't know. That's, that doesn't explain why that puts you on the back on the fence though. That could, I can understand why in the face of someone who's threatening you with eternal torment, why you as an individual might say, well, fuck, if that was the case, I would just, I would just lie and say, sure, I'll worship you. I'll do whatever you say. But I mean, I personally agree with Matt. I don't see why that would convince you that a God could possibly exist because Matt's saying if it existed, he wouldn't worship it. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. It's like saying, if there's a swimming pool at the end of the road, I'm not going to go swimming in it because it's full of shit. How could that possibly make you want to go swimming? Right, right. Well, I understand. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. I got. I got to go, Leo. We got to get one more call, and we're already over time. But I appreciate the fact that you, that you heard that. Please let us know if there's something else. We have one more caller to get to today, and and the question is phrased in such a way that hopefully um, we'll find it interesting, and I may not have to say a word. Oh boy! Buckle up. Chris is a, a, an atheist in Connecticut who has a question about gender, sex, and God. So welcome, Chris. Oh, boy. Hi, guys. Um, so this should be pretty quick. So I wanted to ask you guys this question just because I think actually both of your um, expertise or your life experiences might be really uh, relevant for it. So my question is, and this is kind of kicked off. Well, I won't go into the backstory of what kicked it off, but anyway, um, I don't understand why there is such a backlash against this concept of separating um, gender from biological sex from specifically Abrahamic faiths when they gender their God that has no, like, you know, chromosomes, no uterus, like no, none of that. And I, I just kind of wanted to see what you guys think about that, you know, from your perspectives. Yeah, I mean this. This is really simple. We we actually had a call about this on Transatlantic recently, where there there there's sort of there's a couple of different camps of why people do that, right? You have people who are like gender critical feminists. They believe in like a feminist theory that sh that you know uh, you should regard sex and not the separation of sex and gender. You have sort of these like 
MGTOW men's rights activist people who just kind of want to be hateful and misogynistic. And then you have these people you're talking about, Chris, these, these fundamentalist Christians who use that as their basis. And I think at the end of the day, uh, it, you know, we, we've pushed back, I think, on a lot of these shows from the notion that the entirety of Christianity is about controlling people. I, I definitely wouldn't agree with that. But I do think in this one domain, uh, trying to assert that uh, uh, there's no separation between sex and gender. When I, last time I recall reading the Bible, I don't remember the verses about a, a sex and gender being the same thing. I don't think those words uh, really pop up much at all. Um, it, it, in this case, it's about controlling people, right? They 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 have a foundation in their Bible that says that women are this type of person and men are this type of person. And the Bible doesn't say anything about transgender people or about, uh, you know, non-binary people or anything like that. And the fact that those people exist across multiple different cultures and across different at different points in time in the same culture, it it <laughs> throws an obvious wrench in their uh in their bible in their story and what they tell people it makes it harder to sell to people especially when uh the visibility of trans people and queer people is getting so prevalent that a lot of people know a trans person and might even have some of their stereotypes and prejudgments busted already they 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 know trans people aren't this big scary thing who's trying to un overturn their bible so when their pastor comes and says you know uh, for their wives to be subservient to their husbands as their husband is to God, that's a lot harder to swallow when you realize that all of these constructs were put in place by society and th there's no mandate from on high that's being uh, given. So it, it, I, I would say that these people, I think it's it's about controlling people. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, maybe Matt has a different take on that. No, not, not so. anything su substantive. It's I get it. It's really confusing. People gender their God when they know that there's no chromosomes there. They gender boats. They gender animals that they haven't sexed. Like you have to, for like some snakes and stuff, you'll have to probe them basically or look for some telltale signs. But it's generally, these are anthropomorphic things where it's like, oh, she's a beauty. He's a beast. Uh, oh yeah, that, that car is super fast. She's so hot. And we do that stuff all the time. Uh, the point you're making, which I, I think is brilliant, to, to point out the potential hypocrisy there. And I love the way Arden addressed it. Um, I, I think that, that what we're doing is exposing that for them, it's not a problem of them being able to recognize and assign genders because they'll use nicknames. They'll call people whatever name they want. This is, this is an ideological, no, this far and no further is what they're doing. Uh, and it's obvious and it needs to be pointed out every single time. And right. so I'd, I'd like to point out, I, I'm going to, at this point, hopefully that was uh, helpful, but I got to let you go, Chris, because we're out of time. Um, appreciate you and, and hope that you uh, got what you were looking for. Uh, I want to, because if you're not aware, if you, by the way, are watching this and someone's called you transphobic and you don't think you are, you might want to consider calling into the transatlantic call-in show oh, on Saturdays. Um, and if you are transphobic and you're proud of it, you might want to call into the transatlantic show on Saturdays. Even better. But I at a minimum, you can also participate in a, many of the ACA shows because Arden will not just be on Atheist Experience at Nonprofits. I'm sure that we'll see her on for lots of stuff because I love her, the people love her, and that's just the way it's going to be. Oh, I love you too. Uh, now... For those people who know about the Discord that we mentioned earlier, we're getting ready to end the show, and Arden and I will hang out and answer some questions over on the Discord. For those of you in chat, thank you so much for getting us past the 666 likes. I hope somebody got a screenshot of it. Uh, we're way over that now. To everybody who's watching us live, you are appreciated. Uh, consider donating if you are able to, but your presence and your participation in the community, both here and on the unofficial Facebook pages and Discords, really does help. Because many of the times there are people who call into the show who sit on hold for an hour and a half and don't get on. There were two calls that we just had to let go for time. Uh, and both of them were theists that I wanted to, to have a conversation with. I hope they will call back. But when they're not able to call back, directing them to resources like the Discord and those other things uh, is incredibly useful. So 
if you think that you're not doing or contributing anything to the atheist community, to the secular community, to the secular cause, just because you don't have your own show or a dollar to donate, being a part of the community is enough and it's welcome and it's needed. We appreciate all of you. Please stay safe. We are not yet done with the global pandemic. We appreciate all of you and we'll see you next week. Bye. What will it take for you to start opening your eyes, to start questioning the bullshit everyone around you buys? You think it's any of your business? What goes on between my thighs? I wonder, I wonder when we'll be rid of your life. It's time to get sexy, so watch Secular Sexuality Live Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTSS and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call sex.